does the gospel do? Last week we did just a background, how we got the letter, the circumstances behind the letter. Start looking at the text tonight. What does the gospel do when it's received in faith? And we'll cover, hopefully, about the first 15, 15 verses. Let's just pray. Lord, help us as we launch into this study, a book that really did change the world. And I just pray that uh, we'll come to it with open hearts. We don't want to come to your word ever with the assumption that we already know what we're reading, but that our hearing would be sharpened through the voice of the Spirit and your work Work in our church. Work in our church as we study your word, the sword of the spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, this is the writer. And we can learn something just looking at the author. I'm talking about the human author. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Let's just stop there. Um, there are these terms that Paul uses. Uh, servant, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, but the terms will be similar in any translation. Servant, called, set apart. Those are the three things he says just about himself. He's writing to people he's not met. They don't know him except perhaps by reputation and writing. And so in a world full of false teachers, there were all sorts of religious leaders representing all sorts of different doctrines and teachings. Paul feels this need to establish uh, his direct commissioning by Jesus Christ. That common opening in Paul's writings isn't common in his understanding. There's, there's some profound things that go on in Paul's mind um, that we need to look at because we have uh, reduced the gospel to one of its component parts. We've reduced the gospel to just the idea of being forgiven. What's the gospel? Being forgiven sins. And that's not untrue. It's just incomplete. So Paul, certainly grateful for forgiveness. He called himself the chiefest of sinners. But when he thinks about the gospel and when he talks about the effect it had on his life, he doesn't think primarily about being cleansed by the gospel. He thinks primarily about being claimed by the gospel. This is a world where servants, slaves, everyone knew the concept. So when Paul was claimed by Christ, and he uses that term servant, he, he, he recognizes immediately that, you know, his conversion on the Damascus Road, while dramatic, is no different than your conversion in terms of its claim on the life. And so he saw Christ's claim on his life as being primarily something that didn't just forgive and cleanse, but separated him, separated him from everything else he was living for. Now, there aren't apostles like Paul anymore, in spite of what you might hear, by the way, in, in some weird, charismatic corners of the church. There are no apostles like the apostle Paul anymore. But, but Paul declared, you, you go to, this isn't in your notes, like 1 Corinthians um, 6, somewhere around 18, 19, 20, 19, and 20, where, where he writes to all the Christians at Corinth, and he starts it off saying, do you not know? Do you not know that you're not your own? That you've been bought with a price. And it's interesting the way he starts off assuming that this is not an easy concept to grasp. You're, you're, do you not know? You've, you've heard this, but do, do you not really know it? You're not your own. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. I, 
I think about my life, you think about yours, there's that theological truth. You're not your own, you've been bought with a price. You, he writes about it in the, cons, the, the context of built, being and dwelt by the Spirit of God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's certain sins that he's been talking about, sexual sins and others. And then he says about this body, that it's indwelt by the Spirit, temple of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're not your own, you've been bought with a price. So that, there's a lot of theology there. This isn't in your notes. As far as I think about my own life, you think about yours. I think there are only two ways. We only have two ways of demonstrating we understand that. As far as I can see, there's only two ways of demonstrating. One is uh, how we use our time, and the other is how we use our money. I, I just can't think of any other ways that we have of demonstrating that we aren't our own anymore. And so we're all, you know, we're all busy. We all have lots of things to do. And so what can easily happen in a, you know, a kind of a metroplex area around the GTA and the kind of schedules everybody has, getting up early and driving and coming home late and two people working and it, everybody's busy. And if, and if my schedule gets so filled up that I no longer have time for engaging, engagement in the body of Christ, the local church. If I get so busy that, you know, I, I just kind of, I just kind of, I'm, I'm done. And I don't have time for regular engagement in my local church and in the body of Christ. Then, then I don't understand that I'm not my own until I cut out some of the things I'm doing with my own time right? And I say, I, I need to make time for the kingdom in the service of my life. No one has time for that. Some people understand they aren't their own, and they make time for that. And the way you do it is, you start cutting out things that are your own desires in your schedule. There's no other way to do it. Or think about our Think about our, our material goods, the, the money that we have. This, this applies, by the way, if you're the richest person here or the poorest person. We all have exactly the same problem. And the problem is this. Any fool can have an income and generate a lifestyle that consumes all that income. It doesn't matter what your income is at this point. Any fool can have an income and generate a lifestyle that consumes all of it. That's what we call being a consumer. Only, see everyone in this room? There are people that understand it and people that don't, but the reality is we're not consumers. We're stewards. That's a totally different concept. Read the parables. You know how many there are. Jesus talks about whether it's giving out talents or he hires servants to look after his land. There's got to be half a dozen parables where Jesus has some kind of a master leaving something with his servants, going away, and then he comes back, and in different translations, he reckons, settles accounts. And he comes back to, over and over again, these servants, and he, and he says, in essence, D did you think the stuff I left you was yours? <laughs> Is that what you thought? He says it to me, Don. Your paycheck goes direct deposit into your bank. You you think that's your money. I I I put that there. You might think the church does. I put that there. You have a business that generates X number of dollars, wealth, and you th and and the Lord would say, Do, do you think that? Do you think you generated that yourself? I, I provided you with that. And then he says, now wh why, why do you think, Don, why do you think I gave that to you? And I read those words from Paul and I get it. I see why he says, don't, do you not know? <laughs> because I don't. Like I have to just relearn this 
all the time. I have to relearn this all the time. Don, do you think you just have that wealth? Ask yourself that question. Do you just have whatever wealth you have so that you can generate an income that consumes it all and uses it up? Because it's like time. There will never be something just left over for the kingdom. The way it works is you understand you're a steward of everything that the Lord gives you. And so I think about that. Not for you. I, I guess I should as pastor. I think about it for me. That Jesus is going to come back one day. And if those parables hold true, he's going to reckon with me. What, what did you do with all that? Given, given the four billion people who are going into a lost eternity without Christ, um, do I really think he's going to be impressed when I say, Jesus, look, look at my boat. Look at my cars. He says, no, you're, you're not your own. You're not your own. We only have two ways to demonstrate it. Our time and our material possessions. One of the reasons, it still, still isn't in your notes, shoot me. One of the reasons it's so necessary to regularly Paul talks about doing it regularly. He doesn't spell out weekly or monthly, but, but regularly. Just the act of giving of, of my money to the Lord. I, I need that reminder more often than once or twice a year. Like, I need it fairly regularly. Oh, yeah, that isn't mine. <laughs> oh, it's, I'm not my own. You've been bought with a price. So that's the concept Paul has. Slave. Servant of Christ. Okay, I took too long on that. Point number two, this parenthesis on the gospel here. Starting at verse two, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I want to talk about that. Concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith, I want to talk about that, for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong. Remember, you're not your own. To belong to Jesus Christ. So, here's Paul. He can't use the word gospel. As soon as he says gospel, he automatically, his mind is such that he defines what he means by gospel. And here, here are some of the key elements. First, he says that the events of the gospel were predicted. It's in that second verse. Where he says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So, here, here's what that means. That means we now know how to read our Old Testaments. There. We all know that those sacrifices weren't a mistake, like so many, they, the teachers just jumping on the anti-wrath bandwagon. We know that those sacrifices weren't a mistake. We know that all of those things were designed to illustrate, designed to explain what the coming of Jesus would be, how he would bear God's wrath as our substitute. That's what the cross is all about. So he says... These events were predicted. You could see them through the prophets. The second thing he says is Jesus Christ became fully human. That's in that third verse. Concerning his son, his. What's his? That's God's son, right? Strangely, who was descended from David according to the flesh. So if you're looking at physical birth, he's of the line of David. David. Descended from David according to the flesh. Jesus' flesh was like your flesh, like my flesh. He wasn't kind of human. He was fully one of us. So, so what that means is, the Christian faith uniquely 
is a, a manifestation not of a philosophy, a morality, or a teaching, but events in history. God in the flesh. The third thing he says is that Jesus Christ was fully divine. That's in the fourth verse. Declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is not a son of God, like our friends just down the street teach. Everyone becoming a son of God. He is the son, declared to be the son of God. And the proof is his resurrection from the dead. Will the real savior of the world please rise from the grave? D, four. Defined in the gospel, Paul says Jesus Christ is the founder and Lord of the church, five and six, through whom we, us, right here, us in this room, we have received grace, Paul talks about himself, and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. So what that means is Christ is not some parochial Lord. This is not just for people who don't have a religion of their own. This is not just uh, of the Jews, their Messiah. This is, this is a global Lord for all people, everywhere, wherever they are on, on, in their religious uh, spectrum. They all need Christ. They all need redemption through Christ. Christ is the one to whom all will give an account. Faith is defined not in intellectual terms, just the content, you know, like we're studying the Apostles' Creed in my Christian ed class, but it's not just so much as being able to recite certain things, but this, this obedience of faith. Paul's readers identified, point number three. It's in verse seven. To all those in Rome... Who are loved by God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, because the gospel is defined as a work God has done rather than just a system of thought or a philosophy, Paul quickly headlines the, the blessings and the source of the blessings. The blessings are grace and peace, grace and peace to you. And the source from those blessings is God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father through Christ Jesus. Now we know what kind of peace he's talking about. This is not peace of mind. This is not inner tranquility. Peace follows, peace follows grace. Peace follows pardon. He's speaking of this objective making of peace in a broken relationship with God. Saving grace. Not to be confused with common grace. Common grace is God's grace on everyone. Life, health, food, family. So many things that God just gives to everyone. But saving grace can only be had through God the Son, Jesus Christ. So, so my own attempts at morality, my own attempts at being a better person, or my picking out of a, a buffet of religions, the one I think gravitates most quickly to my natural inclinations and temperament, that's not going to work. Grace and peace from God the Father through Jesus Christ. Four. You'll see why I kind of heard. I want to take a little bit of time here. We're doing just fine. Paul has this threefold uh, expression, attitude, thoughts to these Romans. It's in verses 8 through 13. Let me just read them quickly. He says, first, I thank my God through Christ Jesus Notice he, he, he makes like he can't even thank God, speak to God, talk to God, except through Christ Jesus. That, that's the approach that we have. 
I thank my God through Christ Jesus for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. They've got this reputation. Paul hasn't met them yet, but he's heard about their faith. We talked about how they were saved a bit last, last week in last week's study. Verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. He's never met these people. He must have had some prayer list, eh, Paul? I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. And then he explains himself. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. There. Why did you come tonight? Here you are. Here I am. Paul would say the goal of this gathering, and in a little bit we're going to pray together. Most churches don't even do that. The goal isn't so I can get this doctrinal download from Pastor Don. Teaching's important, but the idea is we're here to, we can mutually encourage one another. There's people near you who are going through more than you know. And you get to pray with them. And somebody breaks down and somebody weeps and they're carrying heavy burden and you get to say, I've been there. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. It's, it's, it's a living, organic thing. It's not like going to a ball game. That is that we may be mutually encouraged, verse 12, by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So he's never met these people, but there's kind of three things that describe his, his attitude toward them. First, thankfulness. It's in verse 8. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. It's a wonderful thing when you can look at someone else, see spiritual steadfastness and life, and you can actually kneel down and say, I just, I am, thank God for examples like that. Maybe even say it to their face. You've just been an encouragement to me. God bless you for your faithfulness. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Anything that was a steadfast witness for Jesus Christ delighted Paul, and he would thank God for it. Secondly, after thankfulness, prayerfulness. Eight, nine, and ten, God is my witness. He says, you might think I'm exaggerating. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. These were people he had never met. Do you ever, do you ever wonder... We've got this letter to the Romans, which, which, is, which through Martin Luther and others was just the birthplace of the Reformation and, and evangelical faith as we know it, and has changed much of the world. Do you ever just wonder what gave it such impact? And, and just maybe it was the fact that Paul, Every time you'd see him and he had a minute, he'd be kneeling down and he'd be praying for these people and their steadfastness in the gospel and the witness they had for Christ and his desire to see them. Three, his attitude, longing for fellowship. 11, 12, 13. He says, for I long to see you. I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and, and mine. So you, you get to see Paul's concept of fellowship. It's not donuts and coffee in the gym. It's, it's, it, it's not a get-together. It's way above that. It's not, those, those things aren't bad, but I'm saying there's something bigger than that in Paul's mind. It's a, uh, not just a social thing, but a spiritual sharing and ministry one to another. He couldn't live long without it himself. 
His dominant concept is Christians are better together than apart. Way better. Communion, we do it together. Baptism, we do it together. There are churches that don't make a big deal of those things. Um, no, I won't say that. There's churches that don't make a big deal. There's churches that, that, that do not have communion or baptism ever. Uh, they're meant to be sharing experiences of the body of Christ. Where, where I don't just sit at home and contemplate the death of Jesus, I gather with you and we contemplate the death of Jesus. Where I don't just get somebody baptized in my backyard in my swimming pool with mom and dad and the kids, but we come before the body of Christ because we do it together as a body. All right, five. The reason for Paul's writing. He says 14 and 15. This is a strange uh, paragraph. He says, I'm under obligation. I'm under obligation both to Greeks. These aren't his people, the Greeks. Barbarians, those aren't his people. To the wise and to the foolish. So, my, so I am eager to preach the gospel to those who are at Rome. The gospel, he already said, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you. We don't usually, and then he says, I'm under obligation, verse 14. So, so Paul's concept here is he doesn't just receive forgiveness. He, he receives he receives an obligation. To experience grace is to experience an obligation. And immediately, if you've got a dictionary, you say, wait a minute. Grace and obligation, we could all sing the hymn. One of these things is not like the other, right? I mean, grace, grace and obligation are opposites. I mean, that's what grace does. It takes away obligation. And normally you're right. But if you want to see the explanation for this, look at the very next thing he says. First in verse 14, I am under obligation. And then look at point B in your notes. He says, I'm eager. I'm under obligation. I'm under obligation. I'm a debtor. Because I've received grace, I'm a debtor. To Greeks, barbarians, the upper crust, the lower crust, the wise, the foolish... Outside of my own circle, I'm under obligation because I've received grace. And then he says, but, but I'm eager to do this. I can't wait to do it. And you start to see he has an obligation, but it's an obligation, but it's not a burden. How can I explain it? It's, it's what we're witnessing here is what we should see in all of our hearts is that, is that grace changes the loves of the heart. Grace changes what we would consider a burden and what we would consider a blessing. And, and, and he's under an obligation, but it's an obligation that comes from the inside out. It's his heart working inside out with with delight. It's like this. Technically, you could say, I have, I have, um, I have the obligation as a good husband to be faithful to my wife. She hates these kind of illustrations. She's just crawling. If you see a woman crawling under the seat, it's Rini. Like, I, I have an obligation, but I can't think of a better picture. I have an obligation to be faithful to my wife. But, but, be, but because I love her so much, it is an obligation, yeah, but it's, it's, 
it's a joy, right? I mean, it's, it's a delight. I mean, being devoted to her is what makes me the happiest I can possibly be. Paul says, I'm under obligation. I've received grace. And I'm just dying to see you people. And let me tell you what the church needs. Let me tell you what will interest people in Cedar View Community Church and what will drive them away from Cedar View Community Church. When people encounter this church out there in the highways and byways of life, when people encounter this church and they sense, no, we don't do that at our church. It's against the rules and so... We, we, uh, yeah, we don't do that. Not allowed. And we have to, he's always talking to us, we have to tithe, we've got to go to church. They have it at night, too. You've got to go at night. So I'm trying hard. I want to be a good Christian, so I'm trying to do all these things. Want to come? <laughs> How do you think that's going to go? But if they see this, oh, I see how you're living. And I know you think that's important right now. I used to live for the same things. Let me tell you, you know what I discovered? I discovered true joy. Remember Jesus' parable? I found treasure. You couldn't hold me back from that church. I used to fill my life with the same kind of physical stuff that you're filling your life with, and then I discovered, I, I discovered the most exciting thing in the world that I can use my resources to bring joy to Jesus and I can extend his kingdom throughout this world. Sure, I don't do all the things you're doing. I found something better. I have never been happier. This thrills my soul. I'd love for you to discover this. What do you think is going to appeal to that person? It's, it's mm, 643. Two minutes. It's like if, if something's just a job, a task, Pastor Ron goes up to the hospital, okay? And, and, and who? I'll pick. My friend, Dudley. I always pick Dudley. He's always my example. There's Dudley in the hospital. He's not feeling well. Ron goes up. Dudley's lying there. He opens his eyes. goes, oh, Pastor Ron, so nice to see you. Thanks, thanks for coming. It means so much that you take your time and and come up and see me. And Ron goes, well, <sighs> Don says I gotta come, so <laughs> I'm here. Let, let's, uh, I came, okay? So let, let's just get this over with. Now, he's, he is, right, it's, a, it's his job, right? It's, it's a duty, and he goes, but, but Dudley's not gonna be thrilled. Go, okay, okay, I came. But if he senses, Ron says, I had a billion things to do, but nothing means as much to me as this. What a choice brother you are. I'm just thrilled to be here with you. Do you see the difference? That's what he's talking about. Grace producing an obligation. It is an obligation. But it's an obligation that's a delight. And you start to see, oh, that's what John means. And his commandments aren't burdensome in the old King James. And you start to understand, oh, that's what James means, the royal law that gives freedom. Okay, I took too much time. We're just rolling in that book. I don't want to discourage you, but we got 43 years. <laughs> Let's pray together.